Okay, so the Eternals ending and both the post credit scenes have a lot to unpack from them. The movie is stuffed with Easter eggs, brand new characters, and it also fills in a lot of the history about the MCU and its creation. Throughout this video, we're going to be breaking the entire movie down and also giving our thoughts on it as a whole. The Eternals is the first MCU movie ever to end up getting labelled as rotten, and I think whether it deserves this or not is going to be highly debated for a long time. Where we fell on it, well you'll have to wait and see, and from this point onwards it's full spoilers ahead, so if you haven't had a chance to check it out then I highly recommend that you check out now. If you love the video 3000 then please smash the thumbs up button, and make sure you subscribe to stick around longer than Icarus. With that out of the way, welcome to the heavy spoilers show, now let's get into the Eternals. Okay, so I want to talk about the main plot points in the movie first, before diving into the post credit scene, but if you want to skip ahead then time codes are going to be linked below. The movie is packed with a lot of exposition, and it very much explores the circle of life within a universe. Now like a lot of sci-fi movies that have to fill you in on big chunks of lore, the film opens with a block of text that tells the story of the Celestials and how they created the universe. It details Arisham, who made the first sun, which brought life into the universe. It was perfectly balanced as all things should be, but then a predator species emerged, which came to be known as the Deviants. They were thought to come from deep space, but we learn throughout the movie that they were actually created by the Celestials. Much like the comics, they were made to protect planets from predators, but they turned against their masters in an attempt to feed on all life. Thus Arisham apparently sent the Eternals from the planet Olympia in order to take them down. Now this turns out to be false, but we'll talk about why that is later on in the video. The Eternals arrived on our planet in 5000 BC, and were introduced to their members, which are made up of Circe, Icarus, Kingo, Sprite, Fastos, Makari, Druig, Gilgamesh, Ajax, and Thena. They defeated the Deviants pretty easily, but they were instructed to remain on Earth and protect the planet. Over the millennia, the Eternals helped to take us from land dwelling simpletons to simpletons that have iPhones, and they very much integrated with human society. Throughout the movie, we learn that they pretty much had a hand in every major breakthrough in human history, and this included things like creating the plow, steam engine, atomic bomb, crazy frog, the birth of the United States, and the creation of 90s pop sensation, the Backstreet Boys. Now we learn that they stayed together until 1521, which is when Thena's memories got too much for her, and this fractured her mind, which sent her into attack mode. She turned on the group, and thus Ajak wanted to erase her memories, but she didn't go through with this, and instead the group disbanded. Ajak instructed them to find their own purposes, and when they reunited, tell her what they'd found. They all kind of have their own stories, but I think Kingo has by far the funniest one. He ended up becoming a Bollywood actor, and even pretended to be his own grandson and son in order to explain why he hadn't aged. He pretty much created an entire fake family based around himself so that he could keep acting, and it's a pretty creative backstory that I'm sure Keanu Reeves is taking notes on. Now Druig ended up leaving with a group of humans in order to see if there was a way to stop us warring. He possesses the ability to control minds, and he pretty much wants to stop the self-destructive path that humanity is on. Fastos went on to have a family, Makari remained on the ship, and Gilgamesh took Thena away in order to care for her. After a relationship that lasted several lifetimes, Cersei and Icarus split up, and she ended up moving to England. Cersei then ended up dating Dane Whitman, who you might know as being the Black Knight from the comics. Sprite was sent to her by Ajax to check in to see if everything was okay, and that's pretty much where we pick up with the characters. Now one big question that was floating around about the movie is why didn't they help to stop Thanos? They ended up hanging back like Batman during the Doomsday fight, and the movie actually gives a pretty good answer. The Eternals were supposed to be there to protect us from the Deviants, but they also understood that if they stepped in the way of every single threat, that it would harm our own development. Nothing breeds change like a challenge, and thus they've waited on Earth until they're told that they can return home. Now the present day stuff is where the true thrust of the movie comes from, and after an earthquake rocks the planet, a Deviant emerges that has the ability to regenerate. This attacks Cersei, Sprite and Dane, and Icarus arrives in order to help out. Together they then travel to Ajax's house to find her dead by Deviant. From this point onwards they reunite with the rest of the group, and unearth exactly what's going on. Now Ajax had an orb that allowed her to communicate with Arisham, and this goes into Cersei, which leads to the discovery that there's a seed within the planet. This is actually an unborn celestial, and as the intelligent population grows, the seed grows along with it. Once the Earth gets to a certain point, the seed will be able to finally come to fruition, and the Celestial will fully form, which will completely destroy the planet. 
This is known as the Emergence, and it's something that the Celestials have carried out ever since the dawn of time in order to birth more of them. After they're created, Celestials then make new suns and galaxies, and thus the Celestials must be birthed from this destruction in order to allow the rest of the universe to thrive. We learn the one on Earth is called Tiamat, and in the comics, he's actually known as the Dreaming Celestial. Now the earthquake was part of the process and slowly the pieces all start to fall into place that finally prove that hashtag Thanos was right. Interestingly, the Avengers bringing everyone back with the blip actually sped up the process as the planet suddenly thrived once more, which made everything move faster than Kevin's spoilers. Now we discover that the Celestials made the Deviants to protect the population of a planet, but they ended up evolving and turning against their masters. Upon a planet being destroyed, the Deviants were killed along with it, and thus they're trying to stop the Emergence for their own survival. This led to the Celestials having to create the Eternals to take them out, and everything is very much shrouded in shades of grey. The Eternals are synthetic and therefore incapable of evolution, and thus they haven't carried the same faults that the Deviants had. We discover that the Eternals have been complicit in the destruction of several planets, and that they've had their minds erased after each emergence so that they could go on to more and continue to carry out the process again. Dina went crazy because her mind wasn't correctly erased, and she still carried forth some of the memories from these past processes. There is no Olympia, and the Eternals are all machines that are created in the World Forge, which is where their memories are stored. Now I really enjoy this exploration into the lore, and though it's very heavy on the exposition, I enjoyed how much the movie kinda gave each set of characters their own drives and motivations that you could completely understand. I've seen some reviews say that each of the characters are underdeveloped, and even one review about this movie basically being what would happen if the first time that we were introduced to the Avengers was in their team up movie. I have to completely disagree and I think that each of them works well, has their own complexities and also their own little flaws which makes them easy to relate to. After meeting with Druig they're attacked by the Deviants leader, who you may know as being called Crow from the comics. He absorbs Gilgamesh and then evolves which causes the Eternal to die. Because of this, Druig agrees to help put the Celestial and the planet to sleep so that they can finally stop all this chaos. They go to Fastos, who because of his husband and son, has realised that humanity has good in them. He agrees to join them in order to create a Unimind, which is not only a terrible name, but it's basically something that's going to unite them all so that they can destroy the Celestial. They venture to the ship and find Makari, and shortly after we learn that Icarus has been well aware of the emergence process for a long time. He went to Ajax to find that she changed her mind about carrying it out, and this is because when they split up, she realised that humanity likes to live, laugh, love. Now Icarus betrayed her, and he fed her to the Deviants. He brought everyone together to protect them from the monsters, and once his plan is revealed, he turns on the group. Sprite actually leaves with him, and Kingo drops out of the group because he agrees with his point of view, however he'd rather not fight his friends, and he's basically just fence sitting. Together, the remaining Eternals vow to stop Icarus and the Emergence, which leads to them all going head to head. Crow arrives during this, and Athena kills him, which brings her memories back. Druig is blocked from controlling the Celestial, but Cersei then starts to connect to it, which is when Sprite stabs her in the back. She says that because she can't grow up, that living amongst the humans was torture, as she realised she'd never be able to really experience a full life. Druig knocks her out, and Cersei begins to turn the Celestial to stone. Icarus goes to stop her, but he realises that because he loves her, that he can't bring himself to kill her, and together they all unite to stop the Emergence. After putting a halt to the destruction, Icarus makes like his namesake and flies towards the sun, but he goes all the way into the star, whereas that guy just fell to earth. Now Cersei uses her abilities to transform Sprite into a real girl, and after a last supper, Druig, Thena and Makari travel into space to find more Eternals. Cersei and Kingo watch as Sprite goes off to school, and Dane says that though he's still trying to get his head around everything, that he loves Cersei no matter what. Dane teases that he has a complicated family history, and Arishim pulls the Eternals into space. He states that he knows they chose the planet over the birth of a Celestial, and says he will look through their memories and return with a judgement, which will decide whether humanity deserves to live or not. For the final scene, we journey back to Earth and see Dane panicking because he's just watched his girlfriend being pulled into space. That kind of takes us into the second post credit scene, in which we watch him debating whether he should take an ancestral sword that belonged to his family. 
This is contained in a box with medieval markings on it and upon moving his hands towards it, the sword starts to react. This is clearly setting him up to become the Black Knight, a Marvel hero that's been part of groups such as the Avengers and Heroes for Hire. Throughout the history of Marvel, there have been several versions of the character which are all part of the same family tree. They passed on this mantle down through their children and originally Whitman's uncle was a villain. This adds a lot to the complicated history that he talks about and in the comics, Dane's uncle passed the sword to him and said that he should restore the honour to his family that his criminality had destroyed. At one point in the comics, both he and Cersei travel back in time together and it could be possible that the pair will indeed be going through the ages in a future film in order to discover the origins of the sword. This would also allow him to interact with his ancestors and learn about all of the things that his family had done. Now the sword he finds is likely the ebony blade, which like his family has somewhat of a complicated nature to it. Though it can bestow great power on those that can wield it, it also has a downside. The sword is cursed and if one spends too much time wielding it, they can become violent, aggressive and corrupted. I think this would make for a really good storyline for the future and it definitely may be a direction that they take things in the sequels. Now why something reality breaking could be happening is because we hear a disembodied voice asking if he's ready. I've spoken to a lot of people and no one seems to know exactly who it is, but I actually think that it sounds a lot like Jeffrey Wright aka The Watcher. The Watcher only tends to appear in a universe upon something major happening and in the comics when he arrived during Civil War, the heroes caked their pants because it was a signal that things could go very badly. That's also the kind of vibe that I get from this moment and due to the curse potentially being placed on the blade, it is possible that this could lead to either a new defender being created or an evil antagonist for Earth. I think that we will likely get the former over the latter, but the Eternals has shown us with Icarus that things can go beyond being black and white. Now the second post credit scene picks up with the Eternals in space and we meet two brand new characters. The first is Pip the Troll, who hails from the planet Laxadasia. Pip didn't originally look like a troll, but the character ended up drinking a liquor that transformed him into one and thus he was exiled from his planet. After that he travelled through the universe and eventually ended up joining forces with Adam Warlock, who we now know is going to be played by Will Poulter in the MCU. Warlock was teased at the end of Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 2 and it is possible that Pip may appear in the third film or that he could end up meeting Adam Warlock in the next Eternals movie. Now Pip is very much here to introduce Eros aka Star Fox who's played by Harry Styles. Upon entering, Pip lists off everything you need to know about him and as he mentions, he is indeed the brother of Thanos. Now in the comics, Thanos was a citizen of Titan but the character had a deviant gene which is what gave him his appearance. Thanos wanted to bring genocide to the planet in order to save it from destabilizing and this led to his banishment. We haven't really seen the relationship between Eros and his brother yet and I would love to have it shown in things like a flashback or potentially even the multiverse. Pip also states that he has defeated Black Roger and he follows this up by saying he's from the mystery planet. Now Black Roger is likely a nod to Dark Roger who was the monarch of Mystery Planet, but after Pip called him Black Robert, I'm not sure if he knows the correct name anyway. Eros confirms that he too is an Eternal in their greeting and this could mean that much like the comics, Thanos is also one who simply carried a deviant gene. Now I'm not sure how it works with them being machines, but potentially Thanos was aware of the Celestials plan and this is why he wanted to keep the population down to a certain amount. Eros is actually the younger brother of Thanos and though initially he had no aspirations of being a hero, this changed when one of Thanos' attacks led to the death of their mother. Over the years, the pair have gone head to head and he wields several cosmic powers similar to the Eternals. After relocating to Earth, he joined the Avengers and got the name Star Fox. The Eternals all have their own abilities and he can induce pleasure amongst people which makes them obsessed with him. And oh my god, it's, it's Harry Styles! Now Eros presents a sphere and says that though their friends are in big trouble, he knows where to find them. This clearly teases that the Eternals will continue the search for more of their kind and I actually think that this will lead to them showing the rest of the Eternals in the galaxy the truth about their missions. This could lead to an all out war against the Celestials and I think it would be really tense if Arishim returned to Earth to say that he decided to destroy the planet. This would lead to the heroes having to unite to take him down 
and I love it if Galactus was introduced through this. When the trailer first dropped, a lot of people thought that he was actually Arishim, and though it's not really in line with the comics, he could end up becoming a servant of them, and that could push Galactus into destroying the planet. That is a pretty big deviation from what's in the source material, but I'm just giving fan theories here, yeah, and you know, it's not like I'm gonna be right anyway, but they're just fun to discuss. Either way, I can see them heading towards an Eternals vs Celestial showdown, as this movie clearly hinted towards them being on opposite sides of the same coin. I think that in the next entry, they'll probably travel to the Forge and regain all their memories. We were told by Arishim that this is where they were kept, so it makes sense for that to be a MacGuffin in the next film. I think that would be a great direction to take the series, but let us know your thoughts below if you disagree that it's not Mephisto. Now as for my thoughts, I'm getting to the point now yeah, where I seem to disagree with every single Rotten Tomatoes score as I really enjoyed this. Though it's the first rotten MCU movie, I think that it's way better than Captain Marvel, The Incredible Hulk, Black Widow, Iron Man 2, Iron Man 3, Thor and Thor The Dark World. Though it has lots of weighty exposition, I found most of the conversations to be worthwhile philosophical ones that discussed heavy topics like life and death on a universal scale. Each of the characters also had their own aspects to them, and I found each of the points of view relatable in some ways. Now the movie is a long one, but I didn't really mind the runtime. I find with a lot of Marvel movies, you can often tell I've cut stuff out to keep things moving, but it was actually nice to just spend time with the characters and hear what they had to say. Saying that though, I completely understand that this movie won't be for everyone, and that there will be a lot of people that just don't like it. Weirdly, at points it feels more like a DC movie than a Marvel one, and that's even without the references to Batman and Superman. I think that it's still a pretty strong entry though, and even if it's not in my top 10, it's probably one of my preferred origin stories because it's not just going through the motions like a lot of them are. Now with the praise of course comes some negativity, and I think that the action is lacking at some points in the film. It doesn't really have many spectacles, and a lot of the time the battles are pretty small scale, with people just flying around and punching the deviants. There's also a lot of characters to comprehend, and I think some of them could have been cut from the film without us missing them at all. Still though, The Eternals was way better than I was expecting. I don't know if it's because I heard it was a mess that I went in thinking it wouldn't be that good, but overall I found it surprisingly enjoyable. As we discussed on my last June video, expectations before a movie can often decide your eventual enjoyment, so I do kind of want to sit on this for a couple of days before I come all out and say exactly how I feel about it. This is very much a first reaction to it, and I'm going to see it again tomorrow, which should kind of clear up how I feel. Saying that though, coming straight out of the cinema and starting to work on this video, I'm way more focused on the positives of the movie over the negatives. I think it's going to be a divisive film, but I'm definitely in the camp of people that enjoyed it. Chloe Zhao has brought something new to the MCU, and this is a philosophical movie about what it means to be human, which I really appreciate. Though it's not going to be many people's favourite, I'd love to see the Eternals back, and because of that I'm scoring it a 7.5 out of 10. Now obviously I'd love to hear your thoughts on the film, as I can tell from the early reactions on Twitter that people are going to be very divided. Leave them below and just to let you know, we're running a competition right now and giving away 3 copies of the Zack Snyder DC Trilogy on the 30th of November. All you have to do to be on the chance of winning is like the video, make sure you subscribe with notifications on, and drop a comment below with your thoughts on the film. We pick the comments at random at the end of the month and the winners of the last one are on screen right now, so if that's you then message me on Twitter at Heavy Spoilers. If you want something else to watch then make sure you check out our breakdown of the Morbius trailer which will be linked on screen right now. We went over all the easter eggs, talked about what the hell's going on with the multiverse, and also just give our reaction to it. If not, then I hope you enjoy your weekend, you take care of yourself, I've been Paul, and I'll see you on the next one. I'm out bitches, peace.